For those who come here seeking God, may God go with you. For those who come embracing life, may life return your affections. And for those who come to seek a path, may a way be found and the courage to take it step by step. Our first of three readings this morning comes from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 15, verses 33 through 47. When it was noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, Listen, he is calling for Elijah. And someone ran, filled a sponge with sour wine, put it on a stick, and gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to take him down. Then Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Now when the centurion who stood facing him saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was God's son. There were also women looking on from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James the Younger, and of Joses and Salome. These used to follow him and provide for him when he was in Galilee, and there were many other women who had come up with him to Jerusalem. When evening had come, and since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who also himself, waiting expectantly for the kingdom of God, went boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate wondered if he were already dead, and summoning the centurion, he asked him whether he had been dead for some time. When he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the body to Joseph. Then Joseph bought a linen cloth, and taking down the body, wrapped it in the linen cloth and laid it in a tomb that had been hewn out of the rock. He then rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Josie, saw where the body was laid. The centurion in the Easter story has always fascinated me. He is the head of the Roman guard that crucified Jesus. He stands at the foot of the cross and stands witness to Jesus' suffering and death. By definition, he's a Gentile, not a Jew. The Roman army that occupied Judea at the time would never have let a Jew into a position of such power and authority. As a Gentile, to the extent that he was a believer at all, he likely believed in a pantheon of gods and goddesses, including Jupiter, Juno, Apollo, and Diana as well as the mythological stories that he grew up hearing. So picture the scene. Here's a Roman army officer, rugged and battle-weary, standing at the foot of the cross. He watches as his soldiers cast lots for Jesus' clothing. These were the spoils of this particular battle. As the day wears on, he starts to notice that it's getting darker out. At first, perhaps he thinks that maybe it's just the clouds moving in, blocking out the sun, but this darkness that's descending is unlike anything that he's seen before. Now, for us, in our modern sensibilities, we might think, oh, this is a solar eclipse that's happening. But, of course, he would have no sense of that. The centurion doesn't know what's happening, but he's probably getting worried about his safety and that of his regiment. He's probably thinking something like, okay, let's get on with it here. Would you just go ahead and die? The sooner you die, the quicker we can all go home. But Jesus doesn't die, not that fast at least. He hangs on the cross crying out in pain and desperation and the darkness continues to deepen and descend. Like the gathered crowd, likely the gathered crowd is getting restless and anxious And likely the centurion is worried about keeping control of the crowd that has been taunting Jesus for hours. How dark will it get, 
he wonders to himself. And what will I do? After all, he's the one who's in charge. Then Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the centurion, who has supervised dozens of crucifixions, knows by the tone in the man's voice that the end is near. And then, at least in our own cinematic imaginations, there is a great earthquake, a rending of the earth. Lightning fills the sky. Briefly, it feels like the end of the world is upon all of those gathered on Golgotha when Jesus breathes his last breath and dies on the cross. And we are told at that point that the centurion utters these words, Surely this was the Son of God. We are led to believe that witnessing Jesus' death on the cross, this man, this most hard-hearted, battle-tested career soldier of a vicious occupying army was instantly converted, that the scales were removed from his eyes and he saw Jesus for who Jesus really was. We are led to believe that the centurion in that instant became a believer. I can imagine that an event like this would cause someone, anyone, me even perhaps, to have a conversion experience. I'm wondering, though, what it would take for us, other than that, to actually believe. Now let me say I'm not talking about being born again in the Christian meaning of that term, and I'm not asking what it would take for us to believe that Jesus was God incarnate. What the centurion's experience and his response to Jesus' death calls us to question is where our own faith comes from. Where our own faith comes from. How do we find and claim and keep our faith? Be it faith in the goodness of the world, in the power of love, or in the abiding presence of a power greater than ourselves that for centuries has been called God. This, I think, is in fact the very question that the Easter story itself, the story of death and resurrection, calls us to consider. Where does our faith come from? Where do we find our faith? We are, after all, I think, born a faithful people. As infants, we trust and believe with our entire bodies that we will be cared for, that we will be nurtured, that we will be loved. It's a gift and a given. But then something happens that turns our world upside down. Perhaps a parent walks out on our family. A sibling is diagnosed with a terminal illness. A beloved grandparent dies. Bad things happen to good people. And we learn that the world is not as we thought it was. Our faith is shaken, bruised, battered, perhaps broken entirely. We suffer a kind of death in this loss of faith. What does it take to regain, to resurrect, if you will, our faith once it's compromised or lost? Assuming that unlike the centurion, we don't get earthquakes and lightning and darkness at noon, where do we even begin to look for our faith? Perhaps it's in nature, in the certain cycles of the seasons, As we see the fragile shoots begin to emerge after a long, hard winter, so we may come to believe that we too might emerge from the darkest seasons of our souls. Or perhaps it's being on the receiving end of the kindness of strangers. Maybe that's how our faith is restored. Maybe we were the person beset by robbers on the road to Jericho. And a good Samaritan took us in and nursed us back to health. Maybe receiving small graces from those we don't know or don't know well, simple acts of generosity and kindness leads us back to belief. There is, too, a theory that says that faith follows practice. Faith follows practice. That engaging in spiritual practices like meditation and prayer, spiritual reflection, and even, dare I say it, coming to church, 
that those acts, those practices, restore and rejuvenate our faith. When we sit silently, when we open the door to another realm or just to being able to hear that still, small voice inside us, when we engage in acts of faith such as that, being faithful to our search for our faith, that in and of itself can generate faithfulness. Serving others, too, is another path to faith. Being the Samaritan himself on the Jericho Road, opening up and offering our hearts of compassion to others, serving a greater cause than ourselves, or simply serving a meal to someone who's hungry, can lead us to believe in the power of love, in the power of kindness, in the power of presence with and for each other. Our faith does not arrive with a blinding flash of light or the quaking of the earth beneath our feet. At least not for most of us. We are not centurions standing witness to the miracle of a man's death and resurrection. Instead, our faith arises from the ashes of our living, from acts of kindness and compassion offered and accepted, from love, given and received. Our own Easter arrives and arises not in one great moment, but is revealed to us over a lifetime of courageous living. May it be so. Our second reading today comes from John chapter 20, verses 11 through 18. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? For whom are you looking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned to him and said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. Most of us have heard the saying that seeing is believing. Many people might even say that this is the basis of the Easter story. Through the life as best we know it of Mary Magdalene, I experience the Easter story as believing is seeing. What I love, hope, and believe about the Easter story comes to me through the life of Mary Magdalene. Her story is a story of courage, change, redemption, and witness. It is true there is not much to go on. All that readers of the New Testament know about Mary Magdalene exists in 11 references in the Gospels. We are not even sure if that is her real name. So many questions. Was she from Magdala or from Migdal? Was she the anonymous sinner or even the prostitute or neither? As described in the Gospel Luke, she was among several female disciples during a time when Jewish teachers did not have female disciples. How could this have been so? 
Scholars interpreted and continue to interpret these texts in the context of what is known about the culture of that time. <clears throat> more is known about recent, or more is known about early Christian history and about Mary Magdalene through the recent discovery of the Nag Hammadi text and what has been called the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, along with the Gospel of Philip and the Gospel of Thomas. One thing is consistent in all the Gospels of the New Testament. Mary was named first in all but one reference to her, an act of deference. She was with Jesus during his trial, his last meal, his crucifixion. She went to the tomb, was visited by angels, and saw and spoke with the resurrected Jesus. She was, as one author described, commissioned by Jesus to be the first Easter preacher. He commissions her to go tell the boys what she has just seen and touched and heard. He tells her to tell them he will soon be ascending to the Father. It was not this last act of witnessing that confirmed what Mary had been learning from her rabbi in those short years before his death. I interpret from her experience that she, among the apostles, was going to be the only one who could see Jesus again because she so strongly believed. Her believing allowed her to see because she could see life through the eyes of Jesus and he could see life through her as well. Because of one experience they shared that the other apostles did not share with their master. All the gospels tell of Mary's struggle with demons. There are references to the seven demons equated with the seven deadly sins. These texts do not describe a physical malady. She was not a leper, for example. They speak of a spiritual or mental breakdown. What was unique about Mary, the experience not had by the other apostles, was that she had been visited by, possessed by demons, had understood the darkest, most terrifying aspects of life, and knew what it was to be a member of the living dead. I know personally how demons can shrink your view of the world so that you feel as if you are in a cave looking at life through a small opening. I know firsthand how the devastating and life-threatening effects of severe depression can bring us to our knees asking and begging to be delivered from evil. Mary's delivery and healing came through the power of a deep mystery an ancient knowing, being delivered through the love of Jesus. She came, to an, she came to understand life in a very spiritual, a very deep way. She had a glimpse of life and embodied life that the other apostles did not. She would know her own tomb, learn how to move away the stone, see the power of that through and with Jesus. She and Jesus, both during her healing and after, shared in the understanding of life, life with a little L and life with a capital L. And they were bonded in their shared knowing. While I am not sure she completely experienced life as Jesus knew it, I believe she had a sense of it that the others could not access. The other apostles did not learn how to overcome fear until days, maybe months after Jesus died, Mary overcame her fear while Jesus lived. If it is true that Jesus was God who needed to experience the life of his creations, it was through Mary, I believe, that the creator could have empathy for humanity. And it was through Jesus that Mary could have empathy for a being who had decided to learn about life through the agony of death. Jesus knew he could depend on Mary to comfort, guide, and love him through that experience. I sometimes struggle with the Christian symbol of their faith, of Jesus alone on the cross, because of the omission of Mary. He was not alone, nor do I sense that he wanted to be alone. The message of Christianity is that I can be saved through a personal relationship with Jesus, I believe that Mary's message is that we become eternal and can be saved 
through relationships with others in a very special way by seeing life through their eyes. By believing through seeing, not seeing through believing. Are we humans having a spiritual experience? Are we spiritual beings having a human, human experience? Are we just beings? If you are here today, you have your own answers or suspicions about that. I propose that the answer lies in the ongoing experience of empathy. As many of you have heard me talk about, there is a philosophy that supports my work in facilitating victim sensitivity training to incarcerated men. The saying goes, hurt people, hurt people. I have expanded this to include healed people, heal people. One strong impression that I take from Mary's prominent part in the Easter story is that Mary was an important part in helping Jesus heal. She believed in the love of Jesus and his message. She believed so she could see. I cannot love because I ought to. I cannot hope because I ought to. I cannot believe because I ought to or because I want to or am taught to or because it is reasonable or desirable or possible for someone else. I can only love and hope and believe sometimes or often, not quite or almost, seldom or never really, and I need you in between. The third part of our Easter story is told in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee? that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again? The first thing that comes to mind when I think of Easter is the word salvation. Isn't that what the essence of the story is? Jesus' blood is shed on the cross to save us from our sins. And by being forgiven in this way, we still have we will have everlasting life in heaven rather than experiencing eternity in hell. To many Christians, this is what it means to be saved. Saved from eternal damnation and separation from the love of God. It's a belief in, the, in an afterlife better than what we have here on earth. It's obtaining one's place in heaven forever. So I was apparently saved. Um, it happened in the fall of 1982 during my freshman year of college. But I didn't know it until someone told me about it the next day. I went to college in South Carolina in the heart of the Baptist Bible Belt. And at that time, I was unsure of what I believed. I thought that maybe there might be something beyond my ability to understand but I definitely rejected Christianity flat out. As my luck would have it, however, my first roommate was the epitome of everything that it meant to be a born-again evangelical Christian. My roommate also belonged to a group that we heathens called the God Squad. Right, now, now, the God Squad would have nothing to do with you if you weren't a member of their group. They wouldn't sit with you in the cafeteria. They wouldn't share study notes, etc. Uh, that is, if, if you weren't a member of their group. If you were in, then, then you were cool. So imagine my surprise when one day I was, I was walking through the music building after a rehearsal, and a member of the God Squad ran toward me. I swear she had tears in her eyes, arms outstretched, she ran up to me, gave me a big hug, and she says, oh, I'm so happy for you. 
your roommate told me that you were saved last night. Huh? Okay, now, to, to give her the credit, my roommate and I did stay up late the night before talking about religion and God. And I vaguely recall agreeing that there could be something out there that I could call God. However, I have no idea how that got interpreted that I had accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior and that he had died on the cross for my sins. Besides, back then as a college student, I liked sinning. I did it a lot. <laughs> and I, I, didn't need, I didn't need to be saved at that time. Um, I was having a good time. Um, I was in heaven, you know. And so, I was just fine as a heathen. So, as a young adult, I never gave much thought to what it means to be saved. There was no place called hell, just as there was no place called heaven. After maturing a bit, um, becoming a UU, going to seminary and studying theology... I've learned now how to articulate what I believe about things like prayer and grace, sin, Christ, and salvation. So today, when I look at the text of the reading I selected that Peter just read, I can see more in it than my younger self would have. In the scriptures that I don't believe in, literally, I can and do see messages of salvation. For example, in my reading today, when the women went to the tomb only to find that Jesus was not there, they were told, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again. The message I take away from this exchange is that Jesus suffered through his own personal hell on this earth by being tortured and crucified. The pain and the anguish he must have endured, I I just can't even imagine. It must have been unbearable. Yet, as the men said, Jesus lived. He rose up from the tomb, resurrected as it were. But I think it's highly likely that he didn't really die on the cross, that uh, sour wine or vinegar that they gave him, I think, could have been some kind of drug to knock him out. And so when they took him from the cross, he was still alive. And he spent time in the tomb healing. Walked out three days later transformed, born again. And I think we all go through our own personal hells during this life. Hell is here on earth. It's not some future destination after death that we need saved from. We don't go to hell. We live it. It's a state of being the crushing of the heart at the loss of a loved one, the endless aching of the belly due to worry, the uncontrollable anger and rage at being violated in some way. Hell is raw emotion and despair. And we are all handed over to sinners and are crucified in some way or another during our lives. And many times, we do rise again like the phoenix and like Jesus. And during our metaphorical three days in the tomb, we too can go through the process of being born again. I've been through many hells in my life, yet here I am bearing witness that I have also experienced many salvations. I don't think about salvation in the eternal and Christian sense anymore. I see salvation more as a part of our present reality. 
salvation to me is rather like a verb. I think we're always in the process of salvationing. And unlike the Christian view of salvation, I believe that salvation is an ongoing process. We are not saved once and for all. I say this because of the fluid and dynamic nature of our existence that ever changing as we become. It's a never ending cycle of reincarnation at each moment. But how do we survive the hells we find ourselves in? Where does this salvation come from? What makes us born again after being in our tomb? I can only speak to my experiences, but I suspect most of you have had similar ones. For me, salvation comes from my belief that God, the universe, whatever you want to call it, puts people, events, resources in our paths when we most need them. And I believe that wherever we are in this life is where we need to be in order to prepare us for our next rebirth or transformation, our next salvation. Salvation, transformation, resurrection happens, I believe, when we have the courage to endure our various crucifixions, the wisdom to accept the gifts of love offered, and the faith that after a period of suffering, we will rise again like the phoenix and be reborn. To me, this is the meaning of the story of Easter. Amen.